The scripture this morning morning is taken from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, which can be found in the Pew Bible on page 861. Jesus clears the temple. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found many uh, found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all the temple area from the temple area. Sorry, I'm just having trouble this morning. Both sheep and cattle were cleared. He uh, scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the reading of God's word. What a, what a treasure and a privilege it is to be able to uh, study God's Word together. You know, it's, it's nice, it's wonderful to be able to do it on your own, um, with your own Bible study, but something special about coming to God's Word, listening to God's voice through His Word as a church. And let's pray now as we, as we come to God's Word. Father, open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. Uh, Open our ears to hear your truth. Open our hearts to receive it. May it bear fruit in our lives and and, uh, change the way we live. And today, may it change the way we worship. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I want you to think about what it is that makes you angry. And I'm not talking about um, getting stuck in traffic, although that doesn't happen very much in Vermont, or, you know, um, things that annoy you. I'm not talking about anger that you probably shouldn't be having. I'm talking about what makes you angry um, in a good way. What gives you righteous anger? And I'm guessing if you thought about it, what you would discover is that you get angriest when things that you love are threatened, when something you care deeply about is, is insulted or threatened or, or hurt. If someone mistreats your kids, you get angry, right? If someone insults your spouse, you get angry. Uh, A few years ago, uh, Colin Digby shared with me that he had a classmate who would not stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and that made Colin angry because he loves his country. He loves the flag and what it stands for. You see, righteous anger reveals what we care about, reveals what's close to our hearts. And therefore, when Jesus is angry about something, Uh, we find out something that he really cares about and we should pay attention. There are a number of places that the Bible shows Jesus getting angry. So he was angry when his disciples were, were stopping the children from coming to him. He was angry when the Pharisees were making it hard for people to obey God's law. And he was angry when people interfered with worship when people let 
uh, things get in the way of people worshiping God. And this morning, I want us to learn something about worship from Jesus' anger. I want us to understand why he was angry, what he cared about, and, and what it means for us. Uh, and so, as you may know, we're still in a series on worship, and we're sort of laying the, the biblical foundation for what worship is. Last week, we talked about um, Israel's um, uh, sacrifices and priests and their tabernacle. Today is a scene that happens in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, which was modeled on the tabernacle. Um, and we're going to tackle this passage in two headings. First, we see Jesus the table flipper, and second, Jesus the temple replacer. Jesus the table flipper and Jesus the temple replacer. If you if you would, open your Bibles if you have it and turn to John chapter 2 so you can follow along. Uh, John chapter 2, 13 through 22 is our text today. Number one, Jesus the table flipper. <clears throat> like all Jewish men who were able, um, Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And there he would have joined throngs of of other Israelites and other pilgrims coming to Jerusalem from all over the Roman world to celebrate this great festival. And that the temple in Jerusalem was the center of this activity. And as Jesus walked the streets into Jerusalem and ascended um, the hills of Jerusalem, he would have seen this. Hopefully, there we go. This is what the temple looked like in Jesus' time. This is a model that someone has recreated based on archaeological study. So uh, this, the temple itself sat in the middle of a 36-acre complex that dominated the hill in Jerusalem. Ancient accounts say that it was one of the most magnificent structures in the world at the time. This particular temple was built by Herod the Great, um, the same Herod who tried to get Jesus killed after he was born, uh, started in 19 BC. The construction went on until 63 AD when Jesus walked there on this day that we're reading about it. It had been under construction for 46 years already. Um, and uh, what Herod did was he tried to recreate the splendor of Solomon's temple that had been built there centuries earlier and then destroyed by the Babylonians. Jesus would have ascended enormous steps like this to get onto the temple mount. And he would have passed through some covered colonnades and then entered a large courtyard. Here's another model of the temple. That outermost courtyard was called the Court of the Gentiles because that was the only place that a Gentile or a non-Jew could go and worship. That was as far as they could go toward God's presence. Um, many people who were not Jewish but nonetheless were attracted to Israel's God would come and would, would be in the temple courts and be near God's presence and enjoy the experience of God's presence and maybe learn about God's word and, and maybe want to become followers of Israel's God themselves. And if Jesus had walked further on this day, he would have entered into the temple itself, into the first court called the court of the Israelites, or excuse me, the court of women, which was the furthest that an Israelite woman could go. And then he would have walked up 15 steps into um, the court of the Israelites where any ritually pure Israelite man could go. Beyond that was this cube, this huge cube-shaped structure called the most holy place where only the priests could go. And within that, the most holy place where only one priest could go once a year on the Day of Atonement. This was Israel's temple. And the temple was the be-all and end-all for, for Israelite worship. It was the place that people went to meet with God. 
It was the place where priests offered sacrifices for sin. It was the place where praises were sung to God. Uh, it represented um, everything about Israel's faith. And it was the pride and joy for Jews. But no one loved the temple more than Jesus. How do I know this? Because Jesus loved God more than anyone else. And he called the temple my father's house. My father's house. And I think when Jesus read and sung the Psalms, which of course he did, he probably knew them by heart, he must have felt a special passion when he came to verses about the temple. For example, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord God Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. Psalm 84, 1. Or this one. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Psalm 26, 8. Or Psalm 69, 9. Zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for your house consumes me. Jesus loved his father's house. He loved the temple. It was the place of God's presence. But on, on this day that we read about, when Jesus ascended those first steps into the courtyard, he didn't find worship. What he found was commerce. He found cows mooing and merchants haggling and coins jingling onto scales. Now, the merchants weren't there just because it was a good place to set up their market. It, they were there to sell things to the pilgrims. So if you were coming from 100 miles away, instead of bringing your cow the entire way to sacrifice, you could buy one there. Or if you were coming to pay the temple tax and you needed to convert your local currency into a common currency that was accepted, you could get that exchange right there. It was convenient. It was a good service. The problem was it was in the wrong place. Uh, it had been outside the temple at one point and gradually, perhaps, had migrated closer and closer and now for convenience sake, for pragmatism's sake, was inside the temple where people should have been worshiping. And Jesus was not happy about this. We're told that his reaction was righteous indignation. Verse 15 he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Can you imagine the scene? There's, there's cattle running from the crack of the whip and their merchants are chasing after them. There's coins spraying across the pavement, tables flipping over, people gasping in surprise. What is going on? It must have been quite a scene. Why was Jesus so angry, though? Why was he so angry about this? The reason is because something he loved was being degraded. Someone he loved was being insulted. Uh, this was the place where people should be able to come and enjoy God's presence. The, the only place that a, a Gentile could come, the, the precious only place they could come to enjoy God's presence, but they couldn't because there are cows in the way. <laughs> this was the place that God's name was supposed to be held in highest regard, but it wasn't. This was the place where worship was supposed to happen. But instead of worship, it was business and commerce. See, Jesus was so angry because he cares so much about worship. He cares so much about worship. And here's why this matters for us. When we allow things into our lives that interfere with worship, Jesus is angry about those things. Jesus wants to come in and flip some tables and clean house 
and, and get rid of the things that block or that distract us or that prevent us, that get in the way of worship. Are you following me here? So let me ask you a question. What is it in your life that gets in the way of worship? What is it in your life that gets in the way of worship? Is there anything Jesus wants to drive out of the courts of your heart? Could it be um, your relationship with your phone, a Netflix series you've been binge watching, uh, your work, a sport, even a person you love who has come before Jesus in your heart? Or, or non-tangible things like intangible things like worries that you're refusing to surrender or someone you're refusing to forgive. What is getting in the way of worship? And often what gets in the way of worship is not necessarily a bad thing, but a good thing in the wrong place. Right? The, 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 uh, the commerce for the pilgrims was not a bad thing, but it was in the wrong place. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with loving family or loving your job or being a sports fan or whatever. But when they come before Jesus, they get in the way of worship. Mark my words, Jesus stands against the things in our lives that come between us and God, that, that prevent us from worshiping him with all we are. And we should be glad for that because his anger comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of zeal for us to experience God the way he experiences God and, and knows him. He wants us to have the joy in his Father that he has. He, he wants us um, to, to know the joy of pure worship. So th this Holy Week, as we head toward Easter Sunday, will you allow Jesus to clean house, to, to come in and, and drive out the things that come between you and God? It is such a sweet thing when you let him do that, when he cleanses and purifies the temple of our lives, so to speak. Jesus is a table flipper. Number two, Jesus is... The temple is the temple replacer. Jesus is the temple replacer. So before long, the, the temple authorities arrive. Uh, they hear the commotion and they rush over to figure out what is going on. And they find Jesus perhaps with the whip still in his hand. Perhaps he's sweating, breathing heavily from his, his labor. And, and Jesus already has somewhat of a reputation for being a prophet. So instead of just kicking him out, they say, okay, show us your authority to do these things. Uh, they give him a challenge. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? They're saying, Jesus, if you are going to come in here and tell us what we sh how we should use this temple, you better show your credentials. You better show us you have some authority from God and do a miracle to prove it. Well, Jesus does offer them a sign. He does offer them a miracle. But it's not one that they're about to take him up on, is it? Verse 19, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Excuse me? Did you say destroy this temple? They say, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Hmm. Jesus' words sent shockwaves through this crowd. Um, there are certain things you just don't say, right? There are certain things when you're in certain places that you just don't say. And one of them is... If you're, in, if you're a Jew, you don't talk about the demise of the most sacred institution in their faith, the destruction of this temple. Um, that bordered on blasphemy. To many, that was blasphemy. 
But the most shocking thing was his claim to raise it in three days. Are you out of your mind? It has taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? Of course, he wasn't talking about the stone temple surrounding him. He was talking about a different kind of temple, the temple of his body. What does that mean? Jesus' body was a temple. We're going to dig into this more in coming weeks, but for now, it means that worship is no longer centered on a place, but on a person, on Jesus Christ. You see, even as Jesus stood there, uh, overshadowed by this huge structure of the temple, stood there in the temple courts, in, in the shadow of the building where God's presence was said to reside, Jesus himself was where God's presence truly resided in a, in a perfect and complete way. Jesus' body. Remember what John had written in the, in the intro, in the introduction to his gospel. He said, uh, the word became flesh and dwelled among us and we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son. Uh, The Apostle Paul in Colossians 1 wrote these words, For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. These are temple images. Jesus is the true temple. Jesus is body. Jesus is life. So do you see now why, why Jesus can claim authority to clean house in the temple? Because the very purpose of Jesus' life and death and resurrection is the same purpose that the temple had, to allow people to worship God, to allow people to meet with God, to allow people to know God. The temple is no longer the be-all and end-all of worship because Jesus is the be-all and end-all of worship. See, worship is... Worship is not so much coming to church anymore. You don't come to church um, to, to be in God's presence like in a temple. Worship has to do with your relationship with Jesus, first and foremost. That, and, that, and that happens anywhere. It also happens when we gather as, as people who are all filled with the Spirit of Jesus. But you see, Jesus cares about worship so much that, in fact, he went a lot farther than just driving those animals and merchants out of the temple. In some ways, in some ways that was a symbolic action, right? I'm sure those merchants came back the next day. Um, but Jesus' real work was still to come, his real purifying work for us. At another Passover festival a few years later, Jesus again would come to Jerusalem where likely some of the same temple authorities who are talking to him now will hatch a plot to get him arrested and get him killed. And do you know what the main charge against him was that they, that they put forward? They said this man claimed that he would destroy the temple and raise it again in three days. Blasphemy. Jesus uh, was handed over to the Roman governor for capital punishment. And we see that, in fact, zeal for God's house did consume Jesus. It consumed him and that his life was, was ended. His life was snuffed out because of his love for God, because of his zeal for God's temple because of his zeal for worship that was his true mission Uh, and god jesus has a zeal for you to be able to know his father Uh, he he has a zeal that nothing would get in the way of your worship He, he he proved that by dying on the cross so that god's presence would be available to you Anywhere, anytime, 100%. Jesus came to deal with 
everything that gets in the way of worship. He loves worship. Worship is in Him, through Him, for Him, for the glory of His Father. As I was enjoying the beautiful sunny day yesterday, um, I'm sure many of you were doing the same, just reveling in the springtime in Vermont. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? As I was enjoying that day, I had a, a mental picture that I want to share with you, and I'll close with this illustration. I was imagining, as I was outside enjoying the sun and the warm air and smelling the earth and the new growth happening, I imagined someone sitting inside with the the blinds drawn, the curtains drawn, the, the lights off, the TV on, just oblivious to the glory and the beauty right outside his door. And what Jesus wants to do for each of us is to come into our house and turn off that TV and open the curtains and kick the stuff away from the door that's keeping us in there and lead us out into the glory of God's presence, into, into the, the, the enjoyment of God that He knows that He wants us to have too into true worship. So Jesus came to deal with everything that gets in the way of worship. And the question for you is, will you let him? Will you let him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have such a passion, such a zeal that we would know God and worship that you came um, and died for us. You poured out your life out of your, uh, your holy anger against all that comes between us and God. It was really motivated by love. We thank you so much, and we pray that we would, um, we would heed that example. I pray that we would be just drawn um, Uh, drawn in by seeing how much you care about worship, that we would become more of the worshipers that you want us to be. Thank you for the the glories we've already tasted of you in worship, and I pray that um, you would continue your purifying and your decluttering and your your cleansing work in us and in us as a church as well. We pray this in your name. Amen.